the next talk is uh, from Christine Grauman. Um, I see Christine. And she's a professor at the University of Texas, Austin, and research scientist at uh, Facebook AI Research. And she's uh, leading this terrific uh, project with a huge effort uh, to build this uh, Ego 4D uh, dataset, this um, massive uh, first person video, video datasets uh, and benchmark suites. And well, I, I don't want to say more about Kristen because uh, anyone know very well Kristen, she's a star in our field. So the stage is for you, Kristen. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Giovanni, and thanks to all the organizers for giving me this time to share our project. Um, can you see your first slide uh, properly? Good. Yep. All right. Yes. Yeah, so I have the pleasure of getting to introduce um, like a preview of this Ego 4D effort, which is an effort that's not just by me or my group or Facebook AI, but all the people you see here. Um, so there are 13 universities and a consortium for this Ego 4D project, as well as um, a good number of collaborators at Facebook AI. And so here um, I'm showing you the scope of this project just to start through the number of people involved and involved in very deep level to to make this new data set and new benchmark collection that I'm about to define. Right, so let me start with the big picture motivation and then I'm gonna get into the details of what is coming our way in terms of this new massive data set. So it's motivated by the need to have very real, very um, accurate and very large scale first person perception. And I know for this crowd, what that means is quite familiar, I think, you know, given the topic of this work workshop, um, but we're talking about moving from internet kind of image and video analysis to embodied intelligence with first person observations that you might get if you're a person wearing an augmented reality device, or if you're a robot or a self-driving car in which the camera is just part of your own body's experience. And so we're interested in this big shift in research that'll open, that does open up so many more challenges um, beyond visual recognition to action and perception together, multimodal understanding and uh, visual learning in the context of interaction with the world. So again, we know in this group, I think in, for the epic crowd that thir third person and first person video are really different animals and in very interesting ways. So here's two videos, they're both of a shopping mall experience, but when you experience it from the first person view on the right, you're really part of the action, right? So you're seeing the world through the eyes of a person who's interacting with it. And that means you're getting these special signals about their goals, their attention, the multi-sensory streams, and very importantly, that this is gonna be long form video compared to anything we're used to dealing with in third person form. And there's no temporal curation, it's just an ongoing observation. So what a difference. And you know, we know that this calls for different types of data and that's what we're about to get to. Um, now, but before I do that, you know, why, why egocentric video? The project in Ego 4D is motivated by two key factors. First factor being augmented reality of the future, where you can have in the future devices that understand your past activity, your current activity, the visual context in which you're um, experiencing your life right now, such that it could have better assist you. So this is one motivating factor. And the other one is robot learning where we want to have robots that can learn vicariously through human experience captured in video. So we do expect robots to increasingly interact with human oriented objects to interact in navigate in human centered spaces. And so this makes first person video captured by people a very rich medium to try and boost or kickstart their learning processes. So this is kind of why egocentric video and, and you know, just reestablishing how important we think it is for future of research in computer vision. And now if we turn to the data question, um, we also know there's been a number of very important efforts um, that have shaped the field as we are seeing it today. And I'm just listing some of them here from over the years. Um, and what these efforts have done are really inspire um, what's possible, reset the stage of research agenda, but also, you know, calling attention to the fact we have a ways to go in terms of really scaling um, even further in terms of amount of video, but also number of people who are collecting this video and the diversity of the environments in which it gets collected. So to our knowledge, you know, largest available public data set 
has 100 hours of content and 45 unique individuals. And so that's kind of, we can think of that as the landmark today and starting point towards this project, Inigo 4D, where we do hope to really scale in all the dimensions shown here, number of participants, meaning how many people wear the cameras, number of seeds, where do they take them, indoor, outdoor, doing what, and the number of hours. So just the sheer volume of, of data that we might capture. And Eagle 40 really wants to push in each of these dimensions. Now, specifically, this is a consortium effort to build a data set of unprecedented scale with in the wild first person video. At the same time, it's, it's arm and hand in hand with um, the research agenda where we're hoping that it'll catalyze research by this group and others for egocentric vision. And so the starting to get into some of the details, the content of this data set in the first release happening later this year is over 2,600 hours of video um, captured from hundreds of different locations, some of which have been scanned as well. And I'll come back to that. There's more than 500 unique individuals who wore the cameras in the data set. And they're not just graduate students. In fact, almost entirely not graduate students. So these are people from the community who are participating to wear cameras doing many different daily life activities. And indeed, daily life activity is exactly what we want to capture. So the motivations I gave of augmented reality and robotics, um, we want these systems to work and learn from kind of everyday human experience. And so we care about the mundane stuff, what people do at work, at home, when they're shopping or commuting and so on. And again, I'll come back with a little more detail on that shortly. Um, and finally, just as important as having big data, new data uh, available, we wanted to come together as a consortium and define benchmark challenges that will hopefully move the field forward with, you know, in conjunction with the data as a resource. And so I'll talk about the benchmark challenges that the team has set up. Now the timeline, this whole project began um, just uh, in, some, in the fall of 2019. And where we're headed is to a first release of this massive data set happening um, late this summer. Now let's um, talk more then about the composition of the data. So how did we do it? What's in it? And who, who's doing it? So this Eagle 40 consortium is um, the assembly of 13 PIs and their students from the different universities that you see here. And these, this team was assembled both for factors of you know, foremost world-leading expertise in terms of video and data set collection efforts by the folks on this team, as well as how this picture suggests the, uh, a good sample of geographic diversity because the cameras that the participants are wearing um, as fielded by any of these university teams are going to be located in the different places where, where these teams are. And so we're actually quite excited. This data set then will give you video coming from um, these 13 different locations, which span nine different countries and five different continents. So it's a great step, we think, towards, you know, and a step, but a great step towards geographic diversity in the coverage of daily life activity around the world. Now, back to the content, you know, what's going to be captured or what is captured in this data, we very much wanted unscripted daily life activities. So things that people do in the matter of course of a day. Again, at home, doing errands, at work, um, entertainment. Now, this list that I'm showing is, um, was a motivator for us to think about where these cameras could go in order to get um, capture of how people spend their time. These are the ways, at least in the US, that is documented of how we spend the majority of our time. Now, we didn't ask camera wearers to go out and do these things by script in any fashion. And instead, the strategy was more to put cameras in the hands of people across these different teams, knowing that they would you know, have high probability of capturing some number of these different scenarios. So it's a balance between getting the diversity of the content without ever scripting it or asking anyone to act anything out. In fact, this is a key tenet for this capture. We want the data to be unscripted, daily life activity just happening in normal, um, in the wild kind of scenarios. Now, as far as the devices that were used to collect the video, there is a variety. So the idea was let's not have a single data set with a single camera for fear of 
you know, future years of research really overfitting some aspects of their findings to an individual device. So instead, there was a handful of different devices that I'm showing here used by the different teams. A lot of them are GoPro, but there's also others like I'm showing here that offer a variety of things in terms of field of view, um, in terms of battery life, and in terms of the modalities that are captured, whether that's RGB, depth, plus or minus depth, um, plus or minus eye gaze. Okay, so we have this kind of diversity built into the data sets um, in terms of diversity of the device captures. Now, the, um, from the beginning, a very important um, consideration for forming the consortium and for doing its work was to be very attentive to issues in privacy and ethics. Now, this is important anytime any data set's collected, it, let alone a video data set, let alone a first person video data set where you have people wearing cameras and in public or private spaces. So the first thing we thought to do here was to assemble this team of experts, folks that have, as you know, you know, like folks in the room who have firsthand experience leading related efforts and experience with managing the privacy, de-identification and other factors for responsible data collection so that they could guide this project with that kind of background. Also, every team, um, every university that came together for this project had their own separate IRB or ethics review process through their university where um, they could formalize what are the, the processes that are gonna be used for the collection and make sure that it was within the correct bounds of legal and privacy standards um, for their institution and in terms of how the data is captured and managed. Now, this meant that um, there are certain you know, restrictions that are accounted for throughout the, board, throughout the data set to maintain all of these standards. And kind of in a short form, you know, often this would mean that faces pers or personally identifiable information or, and or audio would be obscured unless it was um, consented explicitly. And so you do have these faces or audio in parts of the data set um, when the consent is there. And if you, and broadly speaking, if the consent was not part of the protocol, then you don't, and this has all been removed. And that leads to this last bullet here where state of the art, the identification processes were part of the pipeline for the team to be able to remove any sensitive information. All right, so let's look at some of the video clips. Here I'm just showing a, a, a mini highlight reel taking glimpses you know, out of what are you know, much longer videos so that you can see the kind of diversity that's there. These are glimpses of everyday activity around the world coming from what is now over 2,600 hours worth of such content from 500 plus people. And what you'll see is that these are indoor but also outdoor clips. There's clips that are solitary activity at home. There's clips that are more social. There's clips of people doing different occupations. Some of them have gone by while I'm talking. Here's another one um, where um, you get to experience you know, a baker in Sicily or someone shoveling snow in Minnesota. Um, furthermore, there's a lot of great content with human object interaction. So interaction between the hands and objects. I'll play just a few more here. Here's some with some commuting happening. I'll jump forward. Here's some work in a lab and you get a first person view, shopping, uh, entertainment, in the home and in the kitchen, and interaction with other with animals and other people. Okay, so this is a little teaser, but whenever I look at these, I get very excited as a researcher knowing how much diversity um, and depth uh, is, is present within this video data, okay? And again, the highlight is it's unscripted, geographically diverse, and very rich in the amount of objects and activities there. Now, for some of the video, we also have 3D scans obtained from Matterport 3D scanners. Now, here I'm showing you some samples from the Catania data set, where in the top row, these are 3D scans of some certain environments. And they're coupled with egocentric videos within them. So this is very cool because now you have this persistent 3D um, representation of the space. And then against that, you have the dynamic video of someone acting within the space. And we think that this will enable some new aspects of research for first-person video um, analysis 
And it, and indeed, we've tried to wrap this into some of the benchmark, one of the benchmarks that I'll talk about a little bit later. Now, aside from the scans, some of the video also allows for eye gaze capture. And here are some samples from Indiana, uh, where you're able to see the gaze of the person who's wearing the camera, and that's part of the modalities provided. Furthermore, on the left, you see there's some data for which there are synchronized multiple views. So two people in the same environment, say, wearing a camera, in this case, playing music together. Okay. So this gives you a sense of what the data looks like, what some of the modalities are. Um, to try to look at it a slightly different way, here are some words about the kind of scenarios that are present. And again, no one was asked to do a scenario, but these are the kind of things that were performed and that we know exist in the data. Um, all the ones that are written here have at least five hours of data for each one. Some of them have as many as 300 hours. Some of the more popular ones, like um, which include cooking or cleaning or other household activities. But this gives you a sense of kind of the diversity of the hundreds of scenarios that are present in the data. And across the different university teams, um, some 10 to 400 hours were captured at each site and some 10 to even 100 different unique participants um, captured data for the different ge geographic locations. All right, so challenges we faced <laughs> along the way. Um, one is that, you know, this is a large team and the diversity goal in the capture meant um, benefiting from the expertise of a large team and, and working together in this fashion. Recruiting non-student participants um, is something um, new and challenging for this scale. Um, like everything else in the world, this effort was affected by COVID. So that meant that earlier captures were, in particular, were as we were really ramping up and COVID was too, you know, earlier captures were more solitary and in the home, but that's starting to loosen up, including in certain locations where it's more controlled. Um, we've set up for ourselves ambitious research benchmarks. So this was a challenge in defining them. The annotation itself is uh, quite complex. I'll come back to that briefly later. Accessibility, one challenge we know that comes with this effort is the, um, the goal to make sure it's accessible even for labs that are smaller or have less resources. And the de-identification proved to be a heavy duty piece of effort for all our team. All right, so I've talked a lot about the data, like what is it, why did we make it, what's in there, how big is it? And now I wanted to comment on the, um, the actual benchmark task. And what this task suite is, is a set of research challenges that we're trying to make very well defined and to provide annotations for so that the community can dive in and start using the data in certain ways. Now, these certain ways need not be exhaustive. It's just a starting point, but we've tried to kind of carve out what are research challenges that span the space of egocentric perception that we'd like to see pushed with this data. And there's five of them. So the first one is episodic memory. And here in these first three benchmarks, I'm gonna move from the past to the present to the future. And episodic memory is about the past. So it's saying, if you've watched this ego video up to the current time point, and if the person were to ask a question about the history, can you retrieve the answer? A classic question could be something like, where did I put my keys? Or did I leave the window open? And the system needs to go back to the history and answer it. In the present, we have a benchmark nicknamed hands and objects. And this is about being able to analyze what the person's doing now. And how are they doing it? Specifically for hand object manipulations that change the state of the object. And then into the future, we're interested in the forecasting problem, which you've seen in certain forms through the epic challenges. And here is being expanded a bit for the Ego 4D to answer questions <coughs> about what the camera wear is likely to do next, where they're likely to go, what they're likely to touch. Now, the other two benchmarks for Ego 4D are person oriented and one is audio visual diarization, this is the task where you've got the video in and you need to produce as output a transcription of who said what when. And that can be coupled with our final benchmark social which also adds the notion of attention. Now at the high level, these benchmarks again span the space of some new um, newer or um, um, under explored problems for ego video. They cover first person inter interaction with places in terms of episodic, with objects, and with people. Okay, 
So next, I wanted to just say maybe one to two slides more on those benchmarks. I can't do them, you know, fully justice in this, you know, um, this length of a talk, but I'm hoping to just convey a little bit more concretely beyond what I already said of what's going to be in these tasks and furthermore that suggests what's in the annotations, implicitly what's in the annotations for this data that you could use uh, if it interests you upon release this summer. So episodic memory, again, that first benchmark is motivated by being able to augment human memory through having a personal index into your own experience. If this was a camera that was always on, you know, you should be able to query for things about, uh, about your past experience. And so as a vision task, this means given a long video, localized answers for queries about objects and events. And these can be queries that are, <coughs> excuse me, object centric, like where was this object, but also the state of objects, like did I leave the window open? How often did I do some activity last week? These kind of things. And in fact, we break down these questions in episodic to three forms. One is natural language, just like I've been using so far in my examples, um, where you're asked to, to find the answer in the video to a natural language question. Others, the second one is moment retrieval. This is more like classic activity detection. So find all the times when I was washing the windows, for example. And the third one is a visual query. So this is a bit different. So here the question is, where is this thing? that I could give by name or I could give by picture. And for this particular one, we're linking into the 3D scan that I mentioned earlier to be able to localize um, as a part of the response, the object in the 3D environment. So both in the video as well as in space. Okay, so that's episodic. The second benchmark I mentioned is hands and objects. This one's motivated by being able to understand human activity at a meta level, that's not exactly about how the hands might have manipulated, but it is about how the object got changed in its state. And this has potential to augment both human learning or robot skill learning, think imitation learning or learning from demonstration. And in vision terms, the task is to recognize a state change of an object, which is a visual transformation from one state, from some precondition to another state or the post condition. And here are some um, example clips of what we mean by object state changes. For example, on the left, the cable, cable got tied or the mortar was cut, or the bleach got poured. These are all changes that um, you can think of the before and the after. And it's an object that now has a new, new um, state, a new condition visually. And so the question then for this benchmark is to be able to identify the place in which the state change occurs and to be able to understand which objects are active in the, the state change or um, predict them uh, with respect to the person's hands. Okay. So that, that's the hands and objects challenge. Uh, I'm two in and I've got three more to briefly describe. The um, forecasting is about anticipating the actions of the camera wear so that you could have a timely reaction or inter intervention to, for a system that's watching this activity. And this is broken down into predicting the future trajectory of the camera itself in the world or the trajectory of the hands and predicting the future action or future sequence of interactions that might happen um, in, uh, after the video part that's observed. Okay, and then the last um, benchmarks, AV and social, audiovisual and social, again, are person oriented. And so motivation is to understand social interactions between the camera wear and people in the scene. And the task boils down to who said what, when, and to whom. So this is um, more familiar terms, you know, diarization, of the video input across multiple people where one of the people is the camera wearer behind the camera itself and also understanding their attention. And some of the video um, as shown in here uh, to that end is um, very socially oriented and like people playing social games. All right, so that's the benchmark spread. And, you know, we'll be putting this forth with full annotations for all those tasks with the data set itself. And so in the last couple of slides, I'll, I'll say a couple words about the annotation process, which supports all those benchmarks. The first thing we did was start with narration of the data by crowdsource workers who would watch the video and pause it at every moment, <coughs> excuse me, every moment that something happened that the camera wearer did. So those sentences you see written above the video, they wrote 
um, saying, and they have a timestamp with them saying C, meaning cameraware, did X, Y, Z. Now, once we have these, which we do have for all 2,640 hours of video at a rate of about 18 sentences per minute, once we have those, we can do things like index into these thousands of hours of content automatically. Um, and very importantly, for some of the benchmarks, do data-driven taxonomy formation for objects and activities and moments. Furthermore, the labels themselves in these narrations are pretty rich and dense, weak labels that one could use in other ways, and we're providing them with the data. Now, the annotations for the remaining benchmarks are quite rich and um, are handling things like um, traditional things like space-time labels of objects, actions, but also hands and um, active objects and NLP query and response pairs about the video for the episodic or speech transcriptions. So heavy duty kind of annotations, allowing lots of possibilities we hope for the benchmark research uh, challenges and others. When we release the data, um, there will be a breakdown, something like you see here later this summer where all of it's narrated. And then for the different benchmarks I mentioned, so you should, about 200 hours worth of video will have annotations for those in this first release, okay? And that release is um, happening late this summer. And what we expect is then that the first formal benchmark competition for anyone interested in trying it would happen um, the following summer, okay? So this is my presentation and um, thanks for your attention. Be glad to have any questions or comments. Thank you, Christine. Are there questions from audience? comments from the panelists. Dina, would you want to say something or? Um... So many people would be asking, how do I keep track of what's happening? How do I know when the data set is out? What's the right platform to stay informed? Ah, yes. So there, there is a, there is a website and this is a great, great where we might jump into a group meeting with Dima's question, but <laughs> yeah, we have a website and um, we will have like blog announcements from all the partners, you know, happening in concert with the archive paper, which will be kind of the, the moment when both the archive paper about this effort and the data itself released on CVDF, which is a foundation for hosting data sets. Um, this will all happen in sync. Um, so those would be the, the means um, between the project website, the, um, the CVDF release and the archive paper, again, hopefully in late August. We were hoping that this is big enough that you won't miss it. Another thing maybe worth saying is that we'll have half a day in the next EPIC, ICV. EPIC workshop at ICV. That the data set would be out there, people would have started using it, and then we would be able to explore more with people's knowledge between, say, beginning of September, fingers crossed, fingers crossed, and, and October when we'll meet again in the next edition. So thank you again, Kristen, for for the talk, and uh, and this conclude uh, the. I think there's a question. Maybe we should just. Uh, is there a question? Uh, let's. Yeah, there's one. Uh, do you know, off the top of your head, uh, probably you can you can read yourself, uh, Kristen. Yeah. The, yeah. 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 There will be, yeah. So the question is, is there um, data where you could, where there's two people talking to each other? That does exist for sure in this data. In fact, often, you know, often in these, the game-based social games, there's more than two. Keep in mind, one of the parties is the camera wear, which is a little different than, um, you know, the third person Hollywood movie where it's the two with the cuts, but this will be, you know, people say sitting around a table and talking and you get that dyadic or more interaction. 